International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carla Cortes. International Short Stories, Volume 3, French Stories. Compiled and translated by Francis J. Reynolds. The Age for Love by Paul Bourget. When I submitted the plan of my inquiry upon The Age for Love to the editor in chief of the Boulevard, the highest type of French literary paper, he seemed astonished that an idea so journalistic that was his word should have been evolved from the brain of his most recent acquisition. I had been with him two weeks, and it was my first contribution. Give me some details, my dear Laberfee, he said. In a somewhat less insolent manner, that was his want. After listening to me for a few moments, he continued. That is good. You will go and interview certain men and women, first upon the age at which one loves the most, next upon the age when one is most loved. Is that your idea? And now to whom will you go first? I have prepared a list, I replied, and took from my pocket a sheet of paper. I had jotted down the names of a number of celebrities whom I propose to interview on this all-important question, and I began to read over my list. It contained two ex-government officials, a general, a Dominican father, four actresses, two cafe concert singers, four actors, two financiers, two lawyers, a surgeon and a lot of literary celebrities. At some of the names, my chief would nod his approval. At others, he would say curtly, with an affection of American manners, "Bad, strike it off." Until I came to the name I had kept for the last, that of Pierre Fauquery, the famous novelist. Strike that off, he said, shrugging his shoulders, not on good terms with us. And yet, I suggested, is there any one whose opinion would be of greater interest to reading men as well as to women? I had even thought of beginning with him. The devil you had, interrupted the editor-in-chief. It is one of Valkyrie's principles not to see any reporters. I have sent him ten if I have one, and he has shown them all the door. The boulevard does not relish such treatment, so we have given him some pretty hard hits. Nevertheless, I will have an interview with Falkyrie for the boulevard was my reply. I am sure of it. If you succeed, he replied, I'll raise your salary. That man makes me tired with his scorn of newspaper notorious. He must take his share of it, like the rest. But you will not succeed. What makes you think you can? Permit me to tell you my reason later. In forty-eight hours you will see whether I have succeeded or not. Go and do not spare the fellow. Decidedly, I had made some progress as a journalist, even in my two weeks' apprenticeship. If I could permit Pascal to speak in this way of the man I most admire among living writers, since that not far distant time when, tired of being poor, I had made up my mind to cast my lot of the multitude in Paris. I had tried 
to lay aside my old self, as lizards do their skins, and I had almost succeeded. In a former time that was but yesterday, I knew, for in a drawer full of poems, dramas, and half-finished tales, I had proof of it, that there had once succeeded, existed a certain Jules Labarthe, who had come to Paris with the hope of becoming a great man. That person believed in literature with a capital L, in the ideal, another capital in glory, a third capital. He was now dead and buried. Would he some day, his position assured, begin to write once more from pure love of his heart? Possibly. But for the moment, I knew only the energetic, practical Labarthe, who had joined the procession with the idea of getting into the front rank and of obtaining as soon as possible an income of thirty thousand francs a year. What would it matter to the second individual if that bill Pascal should boast of having stolen a march of the most delicate, the most powerful of the hairs of Balzac? Since I, the new Laporte, was capable of looking forward to an operation which required about as much delicacy as some of the performances of my editor-in-chief, I had, as a matter of fact, a sure means of obtaining the interview. It was this. When I was young and simple, I had sent some verses and stories to Pierre Fulker. The same verses and stories that refusals of which by four editors had finally made me decide to enter the field of journalism. The great writer was traveling at this time, but he had replied to me. I had responded by a letter to which he again replied, this time with an invitation to call upon him. I went. I did not find him. I went again. I did not find him that time. Then, a sort of timidity prevented my returning to the charge. So I had never met him. He knew me only as the young Elia of my two epistles. This is what I counted upon to thwart from him the favor of an interview, which he certainly would refuse to a mere newspaper man. My plan was simple, to present myself at his house, to be received, to conceal my real occupation, to sketch vaguely a subject for a novel in which there should occur a discussion upon the age for love, to make him talk, and then when he should discover his conversation in print here, I began to feel some remorse, but I stifled it with the terrible phrase, the struggle for life, and also by the recollection of numerous examples called from the firm with which I knew had the honor of being connected. The morning after I had had this very literary conversation with my honorable director, I rang at the door of the small house in the Rue des Bordes Balmore, where Pierre Falkery lived in a retired corner of Paisy. Having taken up my pen to tell a plain unvarnished tale, I do not see how I can conceal the wretched feeling of pre pleasure which, as I rang the bell, warmed my heart at the thought of the good joke I was about to play on the owner of this peaceful abode. Even after making up one's mind to the sacrifices I had decided upon, there is always left a trace of envy for those who have triumphed in the melancholy struggle for literary supremacy. It was a real disappointment to me when the servant replied ill-humoredly 
that Mr. Fauquery was not in Paris. I asked when he would return. The servant did not know. I asked for his address. The servant did not know that. Poor lion, who thought he had secured anonymity for this holiday. And half hour later, I had discovered that he was staying for the present at the Chateau de Poly, near Nemours. I had merely had to make inquiries of his publisher. Two hours later, I bought my ticket at the Gare de Lyon for the little town chosen by Balzac as the scene for his delicious story of Ursul Mirouet. I took a traveling bag and was prepared to spend the night there. In case I failed to see the master that afternoon, I had decided to make sure of him the next morning. Exactly seven hours after the servant faithful to his trust had declared that he did not know where his master was staying, I was standing in the hall of the chateau waiting for my card to be sent up. I had taken care to write on it a reminder of our conversation of the year before, and this time, after ten minute wait in the hall, during which I noticed with singular curiosity and malice two very elegant and very pretty young women going out for a walk. I was admitted to his presence. Aha! I said to myself, this then is the secret of his exile. The interview comes as well. The novelist received me in a cozy little room with a window opening onto the park, already beginning to turn yellow with the advancing autumn. A wood fire burned in the fireplace and lighted up the walls which were hung with flowered cretons and on which could be distinguished several color English prints representing cross-country rides and the jumping of hedges. Here was the worldly environment with which Fauquery is so often reproached. But the books and papers that litter the table bore witness that the present occupant of his charming retreat remained a substantial man of letters. His habit of constant work was still further attested by his face, which I admit gave me all at once a feeling of remorse for the trick I was about to play him. If I had found him the snobbish pretender whom the weekly newspapers were in the habit of ridiculing, it would have been a delight to outwit his diplomacy. But no, I saw, as he put down his pen to receive me, a man about fifty-seven years old, with a face that bore the marks of reflection, eyes tired of sleeplessness, a brow heavy with thought, who said as he pointed to an easy chair, You will excuse me, my dear confrere, for keeping you waiting. I, you dear confrere, ah, if he had known, you see, and he pointed to the page still wet with ink. That man cannot be free from the slavery of furnishing cup. One has less facility at my age than at yours. Now, let us speak of yourself. How do you happen to be a Nemorous? What have you been doing since the story and the verses you were kind enough to send me? It is vain to try to sacrifice one's for all one's youthful ideals. When a man has loved literature, and I loved it at twenty, he cannot be satisfied at twenty-six to give up his early passion, even at the bidding of implacable necessity. So Pierre Falkery remember my poor verses. 
He had actually read my story. His solution proved it. Could I tell him at such a moment that, since the creation of those first works, I had despaired of myself? and that I had changed my gun to the other shoulder. The image of the boulevard office rose suddenly before me. I heard the voice of the editor-in-chief saying, Interview, Falkory? You will never accomplish that. So, faithful that to my self-imposed role, I replied, I have retired to Nemorus to work upon a novel called The Age for Love, and it is on this subject that I wish to consult you, my dear master. It seemed to me it, were, it may possibly have been an illusion, that at the announcement of the so-called title of my so-called novel, a smile and a shadow fitted over Falcon's eyes and mouth. A vision of the two young women I had met in the hall came back to me. Was the author of so many great masterpieces of analysis about to leave a new book before writing it? I had no time to answer this question, for, with a glance at an onyx vase containing some cigarettes of Turkish tobacco, he offered me one. Lighter one himself and began first to question, then to reply to me. I listened while he thought aloud and had almost forgotten my Machiavellian combination. So keen was my relish of the joyous intimacy of his of this communion with the mind I had passionately loved in his words. He was the first of the great writers of our day whom I had thus approached on something like terms of intimacy. As he talked, I observed a strange similarity between his spoken and his written words. I admired the charming simplicity with which he abandoned himself to the pleasures of imagination, his superabundant intelligence, the liveliness of his impressions and his total absence of arrogance and of hopes. There is no such thing as an age for love, he said in substance, because the man capable of loving, in the complex and modern sense of love, as a sort of ideal exaltation, never ceases to love. I will go further. He never ceases to love the same person. You know the experiment that a contemporary psychologist tried with a series of portraits to determine in what the indefinable resemblances called family likeness consisted. He took photographs of twenty persons of the same blood. Then he photographed these photographs on the same plate, one over the other. In this way he discovered the common feature which determined the type. Well, I am convinced that if he would try a similar experiment and photograph one upon another the pictures of the different women whom the same man has loved or thought he had loved in the course of his life, we should discover that all these women resemble one another. The most inconsistent have cherished one at the same being through five or six or even twenty different embodiments. The main point is to find out at what age they have met the woman who approaches nearest to the one whose image they have constantly borne within themselves. For them, that would be the age of love. The age for being loved, continued, the deepest of all the passions I have ever known a man to inspire was in the case of one of my masters, a poet, and he was sixty years old at the time. It is true that he still held himself as erect as a young man, 
he came and went with a step as light as yours. He conversed like Rivarol. He composed verses as beautiful as the Vigny. He was besides very poor, very lonely, and very unhappy, having lost one after another his wife and his children. Do you remember the word of Shakespeare's more? She loved me for the dangers I had passed, and I loved her that she did pity them. So it was that this great artist inspired in a beautiful, noble, and wealthy young Russian woman a devotion so passionate that because of him she never married. She found a way to take care of him, day and night, in spite of his family, during his last illness. And at that the present time, having bought from his heirs all of the poet's personal belongings, she keeps the apartment of where he lived, just as it was at the time of his death. That was years ago. In her case she found in a man three times her own age the person who corresponded to a certain ideal which she carried in her heart. Look at Geth, a Lamartine, and at many others to the big feelings of this high plane. You must give up the process of minute and insignificant observation which is the pain of the artist of two days. In order that a sixty-year-old lover should appear neither ridiculous nor odious, you must apply to him what the elder Corneille so proud said of himself in his lines to the Marquis. Cependant j'ai quelques charmes qui sont assez éclatants pour qu'on n'avoue pas trop bien l'âme de ces travailleurs have the courage to analyze great emotions, to create characters who shall be lofty and true. The whole art of the analytical noble lies there. As he spoke, the master had such a light of intellectual certainty in his eyes, that to me he seemed the embodiment of one of those great characters he had been urging me to describe. It made me feel that the theory of this man, himself almost as exogenarian, that at any age one may inspire love, was not unreasonable. The contrast between the world of ideas in which he moved and the atmosphere of the literary shop in which for the last few months I had been stifling was too strong. The dreams of my youth were realized in this face. Growing old was a living illustration of the beautiful saying, since we must let us wear out nobly. His slender figure bespoke the austerity of long hours of work. His firm mouth showed his decision of character. His brow, with its deep furrows, had the paleness of the paper over which he so often bent, and yet the refinement of his hands, so well cared for, the sober elegance of his dress, and an aristocratic air that was natural to him, showed that the finer professional virtues had been cultivated in the midst of a life of frivolous temptations. These temptations had been no more of a disturbance to his ethical and spiritual nature than the academic honors the financial successes, the numerous editions that had been his. Withal, he was an awfully good fellow, for after having talked at great length with me, he ended by saying, Since you are staying in Nemours, I hope to see you often, and today I cannot let you go without presenting you to my hosts. What could I say? This was the way in which a mere reporter of the boulevard found himself installed at a five o'clock tea table in the salon of the chateau, for surely no newspaper man had ever before set foot 
and was presented as a young poet and novelist of the future to the old Marquis de Proby, whose guest that master was. That amiable white hair, dowager questioned me upon my alleged word, and I replied equivocally, with blushes, which the good lady must have attributed to bashful timidity. Then, as though some evil genius had conspired to multiply the witnesses of my bad conduct, the two young women whom I had seen going out returned in the midst of my unlocked for visit. Ah, my interview with the student of humanity upon the age for love was about to have a living commentary. How it would in my mind his words to hear him conversing with these new arrivals. One was a young girl of possibly twenty, a Russian, if I rightly understood the name. She was rather tall, with a long face lighted up by two very gentle black eyes, singular in their fire and intensity. She bore a striking resemblance to the portrait attributed to Francia in the Salon Carré of the Louvre, which goes by the name of the Man in Black because the color of his clothes and his mantle. About her mouth and nostrils was that same subdued nervousness, that same restrained feverishness, which gives to the portrait its striking qualities. I had not been there a quarter of an hour before I had guessed from the way she watched and listened to the falcon. What a passionate interest the old master inspired in her. When he spoke, she paid rapt attention. When she spoke to him, I felt her voice shiver. If I may use the word, and he, he glorious writer, surfeited with triumphs, exhausted by his labors, seemed as soon as he felt the radiance of her glance of ingenious idolatry to recover that vivacity, that elasticity of impression which is the overgained grace of the youthful lovers. I understand now why he seated Gus at the young girl of the merry bed, said I to myself with a laugh. As my hired carriage sped on toward Nemours, he was thinking of himself. He is in love with that child, and she is in love with him. We shall hear of his, mar of his marrying her. There's a wedding that will call for copy, and when Pascal hears that I witnessed the courtship, but just now I must think of my interview. Won't Falkery be surprised to read it day after tomorrow in his paper? But does he read the papers? It might not be right, but what harm will it do to him? Besides, it's a part of the struggle for life. It was by such reasoning, I remember, the reasoning of a man determined to write that I tried to lull to sleep, they were voice that he cried. You have no right to put on paper, to give to the public, what this noble writer said to you, supposing that he was receiving a poet, not a reporter. But I heard also the voice of my chief saying, he will never succeed. And this second voice, I am ashamed to confess, triumphed over the other with all the more ease because I was obliged to do something to kill time. I reached Nemours too late for the train which would have brought me back to Paris about dinner time. At the old inn they gave me a room which was clean and quiet, a good place to write. So I spent the evening until bedtime composing the first of the articles which were to form my inquiry. I scribbled away under the vivid impressions of the afternoon. My powers as well as my nerves spurred by a touch of remorse. Yes, I scribbled four pages which would have been no disgrace to the journal Des Concrots, that exquisite man manual of the perfect reporter. It was all there. My journey, my arrival at the chateau, 
a sketch of a quaint 18th century building, with its fringe of trees and its well-kept walks, the master's room, the master himself and his conversation, the tea at the end, and the smile of the oldest novelist in the midst of a circle of admirers, old and young. It lacked only a few closing lines. I will add this in the morning, I thought, and went to bed with a feeling of duty performed. Such is the nature of a writer, under the form of an interview. I had done, and I knew it, the best work of my life. What happens while we sleep? Is there, unknown to us, a secret and irresistible ferment of ideas while our senses are close to the impressions of the outside world? Certain it is that, on awakening, I am apt to find myself in a state of mind very different from that in which I went to sleep. I had not been awake ten minutes before the image of Pierre Fulcheri came up before me. And at the same time, the thought that I had taken a base advantage of the kindness of his reception of me became quite unbearable. I felt a passion longing to see him again, to ask his pardon for my deception. I wished to tell him who I was, with what purpose I had gone to him, and that I regretted it. But there was no need of a confession. It would be enough to destroy the pages I had written the night before. With this idea I arose. Before tearing them up, I reread them, and then any writer will understand me. And then they seemed to me so brilliant that I did not tear them up. Fokker is so intelligent, so generous. Was the thought that crossed my mind? Was the thought that crossed my mind? What is there in this interview, after all, to offend him? Nothing, absolutely nothing. Even if I should go to him again this very morning, tell him my story, and that upon the success of my little inquiry, my whole future as a journalist might depend, when he found that I had had five years of poverty and hard work without accomplishing anything, and that I had to go on to a paper in order to earn the very bread I ate, he would pardon me, he would pity me, and he would say, publish our interview. Yes, but what if he should forbid my publishing it? But no, he would not do that. I passed the morning in considering my latest plan. A certain shyness made it very painful to me, but it might at the same time conciliate my delicate scruples, my amour pop as an ambitious chronicler and the interest of my pocket book. I knew that Pascal had the name of being very generous with an interview article if it pleased him. And besides, had he not promised me a reward if I succeeded with Fulbury? In short, I had decided to try my experiment when, after a hasty breakfast, I saw on stepping into the carriage I had had the night before a Victoria with coat of arms drive rapidly past and was stunned at recognizing Fokery himself, apparently lost in a gloomy reverie that was in singular contrast to his high spirits of the night before. A small trunk of the coachman's seat was a sufficient indication that he was going to the station. The train for Paris left in twelve minutes. Time enough for me to pack my things pell-mell into my valise and hurriedly to pay my bill. The same carriage which was to have taken me to the Chateau de Troby carried me to the station at full speed. And when the train left, I was seated in an empty compartment opposite the famous writer who was saying to me, You, too, deserting Nemours, like me, you work best in Paris. The conversation began in, its, in this way, might easily have led to the confession I had resolved to make, for in the presence of my unexpected companion I was seized on conquerable shyness. 
Moreover, he inspired me with a curiosity which was quite equal to my shyness. Any number of circumstances, from a telegram from a sick relative to the most commonplace matter of business, might have explained his sudden departure from the chateau, where I had left him so comfortably himself the night before. But that the expression of his face should have changed as it had, that eighteen hours he should have become the careworn, discouraged, being he now seemed, when I had left him so pleased with life, so happy, so assiduous in his attentions to that pretty girl, Mademoiselle de Russe, who loved him and of whom he seemed to love was a misery which took complete possession of me, this time without any underlying professional motive. He was to give me the key before we reached Paris. At any rate, I shall always believe that part of his conversation was in an indirect way a confidence. He was still unstrung by the unexpected incident which had caused both his hasty departure and the sudden metamorphosis in what he himself, if he had been writing, would have called himself intimate heaven. His story, he told me, was fair as for Garcia, as Bale loved to say. His idea was that I would not discover the real hero. I shall always believe that it was his own story under another name. And I love to believe it because it was so exactly his way of looking at things. He was a propos of the supposed subject of my novel, oh irony, a propos of the real subject of my interview that he began. I have been thinking about our conversation and about your book, and I'm afraid that I expressed myself badly yesterday. When I said that one may love and be loved at any age, I ought to have added that sometimes this love comes too late. It comes when one no longer has the right to prove to the loved one how much she is loved, except by love's sacrifice. I should like to share it with you a human document, as they say today, which is in itself a drama without the moment, but I must ask you not to use it, for the secret is not my own. With the assurance of my discretion, he went on, I had a friend, a companion of my own age, who, when he was twenty, had loved a young girl. He was poor, she was rich, her family separated them, the girl married someone else, and almost immediately afterward she died, my friend lived. Some day you will know for yourself that it is almost as true to say that one recovers from all things, as that there is nothing which does not leave its scar. I had been the confidant of a serious passion, and I became the confidant of this, of the various affairs that followed that first ineffaceable disappointment. He felt, he inspired other lovers, he tasted other joys, he endured other sorrows, and yet when we were alone and he was touched upon those confidences that come from the heart's depth, the girl who was the ideal of twenty reappeared in his words. How many times he has said that to me. In others, I have always looked for her, and as I have never found her, I have never truly loved anyone but her. And had she loved him? I interrupted. He did not think so, replied Falker. At least, she had never told him so. Well, he must now imagine a friend, by my age, or almost there, he must picture him growing gray tired of life, and convinced that he had a lot discovered the secret of peace. At this time he met, while visiting some relatives in a country house, a mere girl of twenty, 
who was the haunting image of her whom he had hoped to marry thirty years before. It was one of those strange resemblances which extend from the color of the eyes to the timbre of the voice, from the smile to the thought, from the gestures to the finest feelings of the heart. I could not, in a few disjoined phrases, describe you to the strange emotions of my friend. It would take pages and pages to make you understand the tenderness, both present and at the same time retrospect. For the dead through the living, the hypnotic condition of the soul which does not know where dreams and memories end and present feeling begins. The daily commingling of the most unreal thing in the world, the phantom of a lost love, with the precious, the most actual, the most irresistibly naive and spontaneous thing in it. A young girl. She comes, she goes, she laughs, she sings. You go about with her in the intimacy of country life, and at her side walks one long dead end. After two weeks of almost careless abandon to the dangerous lights of this inward agitation, imagine my friend entering by chance one morning of the less frequented rooms of the house. A gallery, where, among other pictures, hung a portrait of himself, painted when he was twenty-five. He approaches the portrait abstractedly. There had been a fire in the room, so that slight moisture dimmed the glass which protected the pestle, and on this glass, because of this moisture, he sees distinctly the trace of two lips which had been placed upon the eyes of the portrait, two small deli delicate lips, the sight of which makes his heart beat. He leaves the gallery, questions the servant, who tells him that no one but the young woman he has in mind has been in the room that morning. What then? I asked, as he paused. My friend returned to the gallery, looked once more at the adorable imprint of the most innocent, the most passionate of characters. A mirror hung nearby, where he could compare his present and his former face. The man he was with the man he had been. He never told me, and I never asked what his feelings were at that moment. Did he feel that he was too culpable to have inspired a passion in a young girl whom he would have been a fool, almost a criminal, to marry? Did he comprehend that through his age, which was so apparent, it was his youth which the, this child loved? Did he remember, with a keenness that was all too sad, that other, who had never given him a kiss, like that at a time when he might have returned it? I only know that he left the same day, determined never again to see one whom he could no longer love, as he had loved the other, with the hope, the purity the soul of a man of twenty. A few hours after this conversation, I found myself once more in the office of the boulevard sitting in Pascal's den, and he was saying, Already? Have you accomplished your interview with Pierre Fulgery? He would not even receive me, I replied boldly. What did I tell you? He sneered, shrugging his big shoulders. You'll get even with him on his next folly. But you now, Labrathy, as long as you continue to have that innocent look about you, you can't expect to succeed in newspapers' work. I bore him the ill humor of my chief. What a good he had said if he had known that I had my pocket an interview and in my head an anecdote, which were material for a most successful story and he has never had either the interview of, or the story. Since then, I have made my way in the line where he said I should fail, 
I have lost my innocent look, and I earn my thirty thousand francs a year, and more. I have never had the same pleasure in the printing of the most profitable and most brilliant article that I had in consigning to oblivion the sheets relating my visit to Naples. I often think that I have not served the cause of letters as I wanted to, since, with all my laborious work, I have never written a book. And yet when I recall the irresistible impulse of respect which prevented me from committing toward a dearly loved master, a most profitable but infamous indiscretion, I said to myself, If you have not served the cause of letters, you have not betrayed it. And this is the reason, now that Fokery is no longer of this world, that it seems to me that the time has come for me to relate my first interview. There is none of which I am more proud. End of the Age for Love by Paul Burgett Recording by Carla Cortes